Welcome, Bankless Nation, to a special live stream. Today on the show, we are continuing the conversation down the crypto rabbit hole of securities, which is, again, a, a unique conversation to have, but one that is very, very important for the crypto space. Yesterday on the show, on the State of the Nation with Ryan, we had Brian Fry, uh, who is a securities lawyer and also crypto native. Uh, and we had a fantastic discussion as to what securities laws really are, because I think the current understanding of the broad crypto industry is actually missing a little bit of the mark as to why we have securities laws, because securities came before the SEC was even a thing. So I've been going and researching the 20, uh, 1929 stock market crash, the Securities Acts of 1933 and 34, and getting back down to first principles of what it means to be a security and what securities laws are. And this has been a supremely interesting exploration into this world of securities. And today on the show, we're bringing on another crypto securities lawyer, uh, Mike Selig, who re also recently wrote an article for Coindesk about the current state of regulation as it comes to the crypto industry. And so we are going to continue the same conversation we had yesterday, uh, but and then also get into a little bit more details as to what the crypto industry can expect, uh, expect out of the regulators in 2023. What are the cases to watch? What should we be paying attention to? And how do we get out of the SEC the things that we want? Uh, so I hope you stay tuned for this fantastic and hopefully very educational conversation. Uh, before we get into this conversation with Mike Selig, however, we got to talk about our, our friends and sponsors at Osmosis. Because Osmosis, if you guys are not familiar, is the uh, epicenter of liquidity in the Cosmos ecosystem. And so if you have some extra time this bear market to go exploring some frontiers, check out Osmosis. Uh, it is where all assets in the Cosmos ecosystem get their liquidity, but it's not just a decentralized exchange. There's other things you can do on Osmosis as well because of what it is as an app chain in the uh, Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, so there's a link in the show notes if you want to explore the uh, frontier of liquidity in the Cosmos ecosystem, uh, and as well as seeing what the app chain ecosystem can do. So without further ado, we're going to get into the conversation with Mike Selig, and just again, as a reminder, I'm, I'm gonna make the claim, and we're going to have this conversation with Mike in a second, that if we re-roll the dice of humanity over and over and over again, we will come up with securities laws over and over and over again. The securities laws are an innate fact of financial instruments and financial assets. And so understanding why that is true, I think is, incredibly important for the crypto industry because what are we doing in crypto? We are speed running the history of money and finance. We are speed running the history of human coordination in securities laws and the spirit of securities laws and why they are actually bullish for our financial assets. Understanding why this is true is deeply important for building the crypto industry the right way. So that is the meta for the overarching meta for why we are doing this episode. So I'm excited to have these conversations with Mike. But first, before we get there, a moment to talk about some fantastic sponsors to help you go bankless. Kraken has been a leader in the crypto industry for the last 12 years. Dedicated to accelerating the global adoption of crypto, Kraken puts an emphasis on security, transparency, and client support, which is why over 9 million clients have come to love Kraken's products. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, the Kraken UX is simple, intuitive, and frictionless, making the Kraken app a great place for all to get involved and learn about crypto. For those with experience, the redesigned Kraken Pro app and web experience is completely customizable to your trading needs, integrating key trading features into one seamless interface. Kraken has a 24-7, 365 client support team that is globally recognized. Kraken support is available wherever, whenever you need them, by phone, chat, or email. And for all of you NFTers out there, the brand new Kraken NFT beta platform gives you the best NFT trading experience possible. Rarity rankings, no gas fees, and the ability to buy an NFT straight with cash. Does your crypto exchange prioritize its customers the way that Kraken does? And if not, sign up with Kraken at kraken.com. Com slash bankless. Hey, Bankless Nation, if you're listening to this, it's because you're on the free Bankless RSS feed. Did you know that there's an ad-free version of Bankless that comes with the Bankless Premium subscription? No ads, just straight to the content. But that's just one of many things that a premium subscription gets you. There's also the Token Report, a monthly bullish, bearish, neutral report on the hottest tokens of the month. And the regular updates from the Token Report go into the Token Bible, your first stop shop for every token worth investigating in crypto. Bankless Premium also gets you a 30% discount to the Permissionless Conference, which means it basically just pays for its Itself. There's also the airdrop guide to make sure you don't miss a drop in 2023, but really 
The best part about Bankless Premium is hanging out with me, Ryan, and the rest of the Bankless team in the Inner Circle Discord only for premium members. Want the alpha? Check out Ben the Analyst's DGen Pit, where you can ask him questions about the token report. Got a question? I've got my own Q&A room for any questions that you might have. At Bankless, we have huge things planned for 2023, including a new website with login with your Ethereum address capabilities, and we're super excited to ship what we are calling Bankless 2.0 soon TM. So if you want extra help exploring the frontier, subscribe to Bankless Premium. It's under 50 cents a day and provides a wealth of knowledge and support on your journey west. I'll see you in the Discord. Bankless Nation, we are here with Mike Selig, who is a securities lawyer, although not yours, at Wilkie Law, Farr & Gallagher, a former regulator also at the CFTC and a frequent contributor to Coindesk about the state of crypto regulation. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, David. Glad to be here. I um, want to give a quick disclaimer. I, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Nothing that I say today should be regarded as legal, financial, or professional advice. Do your own research, call your own lawyer, and uh, glad to be here. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I called you a securities lawyer. Is that right? And maybe you could also just uh, give the Bankless Nation a little bit more of an illustration of your background. Yeah, so I started off uh, at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, worked for former um, Commissioner Christian Carlo, also known as Crypto Dad, uh, back when he was commissioner. Um, my background is kind of a hybrid between commodities and securities regulation. Um, but but ever since really 2015, 16, when crypto started to take off, I focused on financial regulation as applied to crypto assets. And, and that's really my practice. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, and you've watched the conversation that we had yesterday on, on the show, and I would highly encourage all Bankless listeners who are listening to this that have not heard that conversation to definitely take the time to, to listen to that because uh, this is a paired conversation. We're, we're going down, we're to, doing the lessons of securities today, this week on the Bankless Nation. And, and Mike, I just kind of want to continue that conversation with you, but maybe we can start at, at bare bones first principles. Uh, and I think there's a lot of general misunderstanding in the crypto space as to what it means to be a security and why securities laws exist. So maybe you can put on your your advocate for securities. Uh, if you could put on that hat, like why should we p pitch to the Bankless Nation why we should understand what securities are, why we need to, uh, and why, why to be it would behoove us to be educated on this front. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean. Just taking a step back and just thinking about what the term security means, right? It is a, a legal term of art that, that is in the uh, Securities Act of 1933, as well as the 34 Act and, and subsequent securities laws. Um, the idea of a security is kind of an amalgamation of a number of different types of investment instruments. So stocks, bonds, notes, and a catch-all term called investment contracts. And the SEC has primarily focused on this term investment contracts in the world of crypto assets. So that, that's important uh, table setting, right? Because when we're thinking about securities, we're not thinking about all types of securities. We're really focused on this term investment contracts. Okay, investment contracts. And, and one of the conversations that we were having yesterday with, with Brian was that we should be bullish on securities or at least security-like properties. And there's this innate relationship between security like properties and assets that have number go up properties. Can you can you talk a little bit about that and, and kind of where you see the spirit of securities laws coming in? Yeah. So I mean these security like features are really investment like features, right? And and there there are reasons to be bullish about commodity investment like features. Uh you know certainly gold, silver, other commodity assets have uh, appreciated over time and and have similar characteristics to many investment assets. Um, the, the big difference between uh, what we kind of put in the securities bucket and think of as securities is is probably just that they're they're man made or issued by some central person, right? Um, when we look at these types of investments, like we look at collectibles, um, digital collectibles, Pokemon cards. I think you were talking about Magic the Gathering and Pong's. Um, all these types of collectibles and investment like aspects. Assets, they have some security-like features. They they appreciate over time. That They may appreciate, I think, you know, Pokemon cards appreciated when everyone was stuck at home during COVID uh, playing Pokemon on their, their Switch. And they said, you know what, I've got all these Pokemon cards. Uh, let's, let's trade and sell them. Um, so assets can appreciate based on efforts of the issuer of that asset, the seller of that asset, 
others in the marketplace. Um, and then based on decentralized marketplace features, right? Like wheat might appreciate in value or oil might appreciate in value because there's an embargo or because there is an OPEC um, action. So markets are decentralized. There are many things that can be produced uh, using other assets, using other inputs, um, and they, they can have security investment-like features. But security, again, is a term of art, and we need to really think about whether things are investment contracts, whether they are notes, stocks, bonds, other types of securities, um, or are they just commodities or, or other kind of collectible assets? And, you know, the term commodity uh, is also a term of art under the Commodity Exchange Act. So these are all legal terms that, that we're thinking about here, as opposed to, you know, is something an investment or something a, a commodity in, in the common sense. And you're using this phrase term of art. And I, my interpretation of what, what you mean by that is that there's an art to it in that it's not a science. It's all kind of like a vibe. Is that is that what you mean? Yeah, I think the investment contract concept, that, that's really a vibe, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of the other terms within the Securities Act, they're a bit, bit more concrete. So we have stocks um, and there's some case law on that. Uh, you know, there are certain features of stocks that that make them stocks, right? There's distributions, there's voting rights, there's things of that nature. And case law has sorted that out. And it's it's not as, as kind of nebulous and, and squishy as the investment contract uh, definition, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and then there's notes. Um, and notes similarly kind of have an established history. Uh, there's certain features that accompany notes. And there's what's known as the Reeves test, where we look at kind of the family resemblance to notes. Um, but the concept of investment contract, this was really a catch-all prophylactic remedial term included within the definition of security in the 33 Act that comes from a pretty long history of state blue sky laws where there were these investment schemes and you give your money to some promoter and the promoter goes out, pulls the money with maybe other people's money and runs some sort of profit generating scheme. And, you know, you're you're looking for the protections of the securities laws in that case, because if they don't register that security, they might disappear tomorrow. Uh, you might have no uh, recourse against them. There might be uh, broker dealers and investment advisors that are touting these securities without any, um, you know, controls over what they're doing to, to drive up the price. And, you know, the, the securities laws really came out of England uh, in like the 1700s, I mean, going back actually as early as the 1200s, there, there were some stock related laws, but the securities laws were really a product of bubbles, like the South Sea bubble, where you give your, your money to some enterprise and they're going out and, you know, striking deals in, in South America uh, and, and trying to drive up the price and, and you get these bubbles. And there was a bubble act of 1720 that, that basically said there are a bunch of, of, investors that were giving their money uh, to these schemes uh, and the schemes were going nowhere. They were just intending to, to flip these, these securities. And th that's why we got the protection of the securities laws in the United States after the, the Great Depression. And the, the idea of, of broadly defining a security and include all of these different types of arrangements um, and products is, is to capture as, as much of, of the investment-like products that, that kind of create manias and bubbles and um, lead to investor harm uh, that the SEC uh, is designed to protect. Yeah, I, I think that's been really the big aha moment I've had going down the 1929 stock market bubble rabbit hole. Uh, it, it was a it was the, the resonance between what we just went through in the crypto industry and the 1929 stock market bubble is pretty strong. But that's probably only true because all bubbles have the same properties about them, more or less. Uh, and so what characterized the 1929 stock market bubble? Credit and consumer credit. Uh, perhaps that was synonymous from DeFi yields and also what we're seeing at Genesis and all of that contagion. But then also there are these like assets, perhaps they're called NFTs or, or uh, pool twos or DeFi tokens that these teams just created. And now there's this like very now loud, noisy bull market that in order to get attention in the bull market, you need to be a promoter of what you are doing, which is uh, if that, if every, and then, then everything unwinds and then people get harmed. And then the SEC comes in and we're like, well, we should have really get, gotten in there, which is what exactly happened in the 1929 stock market bubble, like consumer credit, uh, unregulated promoters of financial assets all created these these reasons that we needed to create the SEC in the first place. And so this is what I want really the crypto industry to really understand is that if we keep having these bubbles, we're going to attract regulators and they're going to do things that we don't necessarily want them to do. And so we need to self-manage and get ahead of this 
by and if we want to like keep the SEC from ha- having overbearing and overly restrictive re- regulation of our industry, we need to d- d- solve that problem ourselves. And that begins with education, which is why we're having these conversations here here on on the Bankless show today. And so, Mike, I want to throw this question to you is like you, you've put some emphasis on this term investment contract, uh, but then you've also labeled a bunch of other security like properties that might exist in an asset. So, but how do we know when an asset goes from just like an art? You, you've you've talked about art of commodity, art of security, security like properties. Where do we know when the line is between just this financial asset that has a bunch of security like properties and an and a security that needs to be regulated by the SEC? How do we discover where that line is? Yeah, absolutely. So let's start just with the term commodity under the, the Commodity Exchange Act, right? Everything virtually is a commodity except onions and, and motion picture box office receipts. So the CFTC has as the broadest definition, you know, jurisdictional definition out there, right? But then the SEC regulates any commodity that's a security. And so, you know, securities are commodities as well. Uh, but if they're, uh, if you know, the SEC gets jurisdiction over that. Um, investment contract is just one type of security. There are other types we just discussed. Um, notes being one. And the, S- the SEC has said that certain crypto assets are notes um, and, and kind of has alluded to the idea that even Ether might be, if it's not an investment contract, a note because of the staking um, rewards uh, associated with that. And so really the the exercise of analyzing crypto assets under the securities laws is one of looking at the features and uh, the full scheme around the crypto asset and determining if it fits into any one of these buckets, like stock, note, investment contract. The SEC has focused on investment contract in virtually all of the cases. And the investment contract definition is defined in the Howey case, um, 1946 Supreme Court opinion, where the court found that investment contract is a transaction, a contract, or a scheme where a person invests money in a common enterprise with the reasonable expectation of profits to be derived uh, from the efforts of others. And so in every circumstance, you're looking for a transaction, a contract, or a scheme. And as the court in the Telegram uh, case, you know, a few years back, uh, said, crypto assets are just computer code. They're not securities in and of themselves. They don't fit within any enumerated category of a security. There is a world where they might have um, certain security-like, stock-like, note-like features, and so maybe they fit within one of those enumerated categories in that sense, but there's no digital asset or crypto asset category. Um, When you're looking at investment contracts, though, you're looking for a contract, transaction, or scheme. So the token might be part of an investment contract, might be offered uh, together with a broader scheme such that the scheme is kind of embodied or or envelops that token. So when you trade it, uh, the scheme trades with it, right? And so in the Howey case, the Supreme Court was looking at an arrangement where people purchased uh, lots of orange groves paired together with a management contract. Mm. And the orange groves themselves were not securities, just like a token itself is not a security. It is that pairing of the two. It's the, the broader scheme that makes it a security. And so because the Howey company sold these management contracts where they're going to manage the groves for the customer and then sell the oranges to generate profits for the customer and, and think, you know, crypto arrangements where there's uh, certain features where there's a central operator that's deriving profits for the the, the holder, um, those types of arrangements fit pretty well within the investment contract world. But take it a step further and say that the Howey company built some technology that was going to manage the groves for the the holders, right? And the technology is kind of self operating. Maybe it's governed by all of the the holders of these plots of land, um, and and they maintain it. Uh, you're not relying on the efforts of any promoter in that case. And so maybe maybe in that situation, when you transfer uh, the the two, you're not really relying on any other. It's no longer potentially enveloped within an investment contract um, because there's no efforts of others. Or if you just transfer the orange groves themselves. You know, you're, you're just transferring maybe a, a token without any sort of management or, or entrepreneurial efforts associated with it. So that might not be a security. And so we really need to think about securities as somewhat mutable because um, there's a world where these tokens get enveloped within security world for a period of time. But but that might not be the case forever. And, you know, there's a famous speech by former director of corporation finance, at the SEC, Bill Hinman, where he said, you know, Ether, when initially sold, uh, pre-sold, uh, was a security. 
but at, over time, you know, I was at DevCon uh, several months ago. There's thousands of developers packed into a, a massive convention center. You know, the, Ethereum is, is a massive project. It's decentralized. It's very much like the wheat markets I mentioned, where, you know, an action of the Ethereum foundation might not even be as significant as an action by a significant DeFi protocol. Um, we just saw with, with Solana, you know, there was there was movement of certain projects uh, o- over to Polygon, and that caused, uh, you know, movement within the price of Solana. And so these are decentralized ecosystems. You can't really pin it down to one person. Um, and that's really what distinguishes kind of these network-like uh, assets um, from, from typical uh, securities that are associated with a defined business enterprise. Uh, there, there's a point that I really want to drill down on that that I think you made that I'll try and reiterate and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you delineated between the actual crypto asset, be it an NFT or ERC-20 token, you're, you're, you're separating the asset from this scheme. And what you're saying is that the asset is not the security, it's the broad scheme that makes a, and the asset that is a security. And so it's not just the token, it's a token that's associated with a scheme. And maybe a scheme has like a negative connotation, but I don't think we mean that. Really, we just mean like effort by a coordinated team, a sort of uh, system of value capture into the asset itself. And so while the asset might be the the body of the security. It's really the the broader scheme that's around this asset that makes the whole entire thing a security. And so to put this into more concrete terms, maybe there is an NFT project out there that has a collectible JPEG associated with it. And there's a mint price for like 0.05 ETH. And the team that is creating this mint contract for this NFT also has very large ambitious plans that these NFTs can access uh, in the future, in the in the fu- in the future time. And so they have a roadmap, and they have a financial asset, and they have a collectible JPEG. And there's a coordinated team that wants to build a metaverse. Like, where is this a scheme? Like, where? How do we think about this thing? Because this is a very common pattern that we see in the NFT space. Yeah, I mean, the, the NFT space has repeated a lot of the sins of the 2017, 2018 vintage ICO space, right? Um, and, and, you know, the the ICOs really grew out of uh, the, the, you know, Ethereum white paper where you could, anybody could issue a token. Um, and so once the SEC actually, ironically, brought its first real um, enforcement action, although you know, it was done through an investigative report um, against the DAO uh, for selling DAO tokens, um, that that kind of kicked off the bull run of mm-hmm. ICO tokens, ironically. But the idea of a lot of these tokens was that let's offer a roadmap and let's say that we're going to sell this token and it's going to have all sorts of utility. So it was kind of like steady lads deploying utility, like let's build this thing up and continue over time to provide new features and, and, and functionalities. And the SEC was like, wait, like this is exactly what we're warning against, right? Because the idea is that you're relying on some team to continue to develop and uh, bring value to the tokens. And there's nothing wrong with a team working on building on some open um, open source code project, right? And I think that's a big distinction. And a lot of the NFT projects have moved towards CCO, which I think is is a massive move in the right direction because the the idea behind crypto is, is really open source uh, community products that are permissionless and anybody can kind of use them, build on them and, and take them to the next level. And you're not relying on some specific team. The team might play a, an important role and contribute, um, but they're not the, the the single efforts that you're looking to to drive value. And so I, I do like to distinguish kind of these network assets that are, are really distributed and decentralized. And you can't point to, to any single person in the middle, as Gary Gensler would say, uh, that's driving value. And, they, they, you know, you might have OPEC driving value to oil, uh, but they're, they're certainly not controlling the world's oil markets, uh, m- many would say, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that that's really the key distinction when you're thinking about investment contracts. Of course, you can have other, you know, distributions. And I think this is an issue a lot of DeFi projects are, are dealing with now, right? You've got a governance token, but you turn on a fee switch and now everybody's getting um, distributions by holding the token. And those are security-like features. And, and maybe we embrace the securities laws there. I and mean, we can get to later, you know, the, the, the complications in, in doing that under the current administration. But um, but that's really the distinction. I think it's it's a product design choice. You can say like, we're going to decentralize this project as, as far as it can go and we're going to open it up 
or we're going to go, you know, very much like security esque products where you get a, a distribution. Maybe you have to make periodic disclosures and and offer a prospectus and and comply with the securities laws in that world. One of the arguments that we were uh, going back and forth on yesterday with Brian uh, was that the SEC only really wants to regulate things that it wants to regulate. Uh, and so if it deems that it doesn't want to regulate a cat JPEG, then it will deem that to not be a security. Uh, and so, which is like an interesting, I, he, he called this the fifth prong of the Howey test, yeah. right? Like we have the first four prongs, like, uh, like efforts of a coordinated actor, investment contract, all that stuff. But then we got to this unspoken fifth prong that we, that Brian was saying existed, which is like the fifth prong being, does it, feel like a security which is to, in my mind like invalidates the first four prongs because if the fifth prong is just like yeah but and is it really like security like as in does the sec want to uh regulate it and if the answer is yes then it's a security if the answer is no then it's not a security like do you have a take do you have a take on that fifth prong and also do you have a take on how much the sec actually wants to regulate some of this industry yeah the, the sec regulates capital formation raising capital to go deploy that capital in some way uh, to build an enterprise. Um, and and the, the idea of the investment contract, as I noted earlier, right, it's this remedial provision or, or definition within the term security. And the idea is to capture these schemes with security-like features that don't neatly fit in any other category. So the SEC has that authority. Courts have, have kind of chipped away at some of that authority. I mean, the, the Supreme Court opinion was pretty broad. It's It's been broadened by some courts, narrowed by others. Um, but the idea really is, is there, there are these schemes where um, people give money to somebody and that person kind of raises capital, forms capital to go deploy it and do something. Like when I, I've got this first edition, you know, Charizard card, right? Like I don't care about the Pokemon company's success. Um, the idea is that I bought this collectible and Maybe they, they're successful, maybe not, but I'm not giving them capital to go deploy it in some way. I don't have a contractual business relationship with them in the same way that people giving money to the you know South Sea Company uh, to go explore South America did. And, and the securities laws over time have, have focused on these types of assets. There have been circumstances where the, CF, or the SEC has regulated like chinchilla farming operations and cattle embryos. And all sorts of, you know, coin collections and things like that, whiskey warehouse receipts. But in every instance, there's been some promoter at the middle that's really organizing the efforts and you're, you're looking to them to deliver profits. You're not buying some collectible. And I think if, if you're looking at some of the NFT projects, for example, you know, things like Chromie Squiggles, they're just artwork or uh, crypto punks that really have historical and cultural relevance. Um, you know, some, some might say other NFTs similarly have that kind of relevance. The SEC is looking into some of these projects, but the idea behind somewhere you're buying into a private discord, maybe to, to, to kind of scheme to, to whitewash trade or do things like that, like that might look a little bit more like a scheme, but I think you have to analyze the facts and circumstances of every offering under the investment contract definition. If, if you're giving people dividends, maybe it's a stock, but but otherwise, you know, you're looking at the facts and circumstances in each instance. And so I think the the fifth prong of Howey concept, you know, it's 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 a good mental model to to think through this stuff. But the, the SEC is really focused on capital formation. Um, they're not trying to just regulate every investable asset class. The art markets have been around for, for centuries, and they've never been regulated securities markets. There are futures contracts on you know, art. Like you, you can buy uh, you know, a future Coons painting that's going to be done in three years and sell the rights to that uh, beforehand. Um, so that there's all sorts of of kind of financial esque markets around art. Um, you know, I've been through several of these Christie's auctions with with NFT artists, and the the process is is very similar to kind of doing a, a public offering or, or doing any any sort of financial um, offering, right? But the 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 asset itself is kind of distinct in in a certain way, um, e even if you get certain um, security like features embedded in these products. Yeah. And one thing I want, want to ask about is like, there's, there's a world where like, uh, I don't know why this example came to mind, but it, it does is like Alameda's pitch deck was 
something along like invest in us because we have no risk returns and it goes like it goes up and up and up and that's what it does that's what it does if that was if that pitch deck was put into like a token mint contract that would be the most security like thing of all time because they're promising returns they have this scheme where they have this proprietary trading strategy which they claim is just a money printer and then they're soliciting investment super duper security probably and then on the other hand of things, at least in the NFT world, there's like, hey, we have these cute JPEGs and also this fun community. And if you own one of these JPEGs, you get to go to our party. And to me, that seems much less like a scheme and much more like a club. And and yeah. so like, yeah. there's a difference between promising future returns and not not even promising, but explicitly providing raw utility that is not in the future because they're already doing it today. And so like there's a mm -hmm. there's a spectrum here of course and a lot of these NFT projects are just just about a, a, a social club that you use the NFT to put out boundaries as to who is in the club and who's not. And so is that that seems to be pretty damn safe to me. What about you? Yeah, so so there's been um, things like seat licenses, right? Like you buy a you know an NFL um, team seat license, and you can go to all the games, get all the tickets, get playoff tickets, all of that. Uh, there have been golf uh, country club memberships, all sorts of kind of, and, and also other types of you know clubs, social club arrangements. Uh, the SECs looked at some of these as investment contracts. There have been no action letters that deal with some of these types of products. And the the seat license, for example, you might get seats, you can you tickets that you can sell. Uh, you might be able to sell the seat license at a profit. But the the idea is that it has some consumptive utility, and so that that's why people focused on utility over the years because it's like you deliver enough utility, and and it's more of a consumptive good. Um, there's a case called Foreman that looked at uh, condominiums and and said that you know if you can use and consume the the product uh, like the orange groves and Howie without the management contract, you know, that that's not itself a, um, an investment contract, but, uh, you know, if you add on other types of security, like features, it might become more of a, a scheme. So if you have an investment club, as opposed to just a social club, that's a little bit different. If everybody is getting together and there are plenty of these investment club DAOs that that are done as, as, you know, the, the tokens are securities like Flamingo and Pleaser and others, um, the, the idea is that everybody's getting together, pooling funds and, and going and making investments and that's fine. Um, but if, if you're going with a social club and, and doing that sort of stuff, that might not be fine. And, and so it's, it's really drawing the line between what's the purpose, why are you getting together? Um, it's a little bit squishy, you know, golf country club memberships, people were flipping them and, and view them as investments, but people were, were potentially just getting them to play golf. Right. Um, and, and they can be transferable because look like you get, you get a, a pass to a community and, and um, you no longer want to use it. You might as well uh, have, have the economic freedom to go sell it at a, at a profit if it's, if it's valuable. Um, and that's not necessarily security. And, and you know, the, the SEC, much of the um, law around what is and it is not a, uh, an investment contract has been handed down through these no action letters. And, and uh, you know, one of the commissioners, Hester Purse, has kind of commented on this. It's like a secret garden, right? Like, it's very hard to navigate uh, this this body of law because it's not judge made law, um, and and that's really the somewhat the approach the SEC is taking now, but through enforcement, which we can get to later. Um, but yeah, these no action letters uh, provide a lot of the contours that that you might look at when you're considering whether your uh, community uh, is is some sort of scheme or if it's really just a community. But I, I think there's absolutely the case to be made that many of these communities are not security, um, you know, investment club type arrangements. And, and you look at many of the, the popular ones, they've CCO'd their, their tokens to, to make clear that the artwork is is open source and, and can be used. And, and a lot of the technology developed by these, these, um, these DAOs ha have also been kind of open source. Yeah. So there's a bunch of conversations in there that I want to, to want un unpack with you. Uh, one, one of them is like, where where are the various bits of uh, flags that come up on a various project and what what they what can be doing and as they get more and more scheme like what are those lines? Uh, but then also I kind of want to just ask you like what's your take on the SEC's appetite for even coming into this world uh, in a in a way that's beyond like we'll we'll talk about like enforcement actions and 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 stuff like that and like I think you're also keeping uh, your finger on the pulse of just like the decisions to watch in 2023. So I want to get uh, yeah. your takes and perspective on all of these things. But first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. 
Uniswap is the largest on-chain marketplace for self-custody digital assets. Uniswap is, of course, a decentralized exchange, but you know this because you've been listening to Bankless. But did you know that the Uniswap web app has a shiny new fiat on-ramp? Now you can go directly from fiat in your bank to tokens in DeFi inside of Uniswap. Not only that, but Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism Layer 2s are supported right out of the gate. But that's just DeFi. Uniswap is also an NFT aggregator letting you find more listings for the best prices across the NFT world. With Uniswap, you can sweep floors on multiple NFTs and Uniswap's universal router will optimize your gas fees for you. Uniswap is making it as easy as possible to go from bank account to bankless assets across Ethereum. And we couldn't be more thankful for having them as a sponsor. So go to app.uniswap.org today to buy, sell, or swap tokens and NFTs. Arbitrum 1 is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum 1 and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. How many total airdrops have you gotten? This last bull market had a ton of them. Did you get them all? Maybe you missed one. So here's what you should do. Go to Earnify and plug in your Ethereum wallet and Earnify will tell you if you have any unclaimed airdrops that you can get. And it also does POAPs and mintable NFTs. Any kind of money that your wallet can claim, Earnify will tell you about it. And you should probably do it now because some airdrops expire. And if you sign up for Earnify, they'll email you anytime one of your wallets has a new airdrop for it to make sure that you never lose an airdrop ever again. You can also upgrade to Earnify Premium to unlock access to airdrops that are beyond the basics and are able to set reminders for more wallets. And for just under $21 a month, it probably pays for itself with just one airdrop. So plug in your wallets at Earnify and see what you get. That's E-A-R-N-I dot F-I. And make sure you never lose another airdrop. And we are back talking about securities, everyone's favorite subject. And like there's a tweet that you wrote that I want, I want to get your take on and unpack a little bit with you. And so you tweeted out, while crypto projects continue to push the boundaries of decentralization and community governance, the SEC and CFTC will likely push the boundaries of their existing authorities through novel enforcement actions. And this was uh, also featured in your Coindesk article about the state of crypto regulation going into 2023. Can you talk a little bit about what this means and what the Bankless Nation should be paying attention to as we go into 2023 as it relates to regulation? Absolutely. So I think regulation and decentralization are kind of counterbalancing factors, right? There, there's a great documentary about steroid use called Bigger, Faster, Stronger. And there's this scene where uh, the, the producer goes out and buys a bunch of ingredients and gets a bunch of, of guys off the street to go create a new supplement. And they mix all the ingredients together and they mix a bunch of rice powder in and they sell the product. It, it costs them about a dollar to make. They sell it at 60 bucks. And they say that it's a proprietary blend. Um, you don't know exactly what's in there. Um, the reason we have the law that we do in the securities world is to regulate stuff like this, right? You are a prospectus, you require disclosure, you want to people to understand what they're buying. In the world of decentralization, a lot of this is open. It's open, permissionless, you can read the code. Uh, the vast majority of the information is out there. I think projects are working on trying to get as much out there as they can to the extent they're decentralizing. If you look at something like Bitcoin, there's really nowhere to go find uh, some pr proprietary information. Maybe if, if, for example, you, you have some special information, but you don't necessarily need the same regulatory uh, structure around those products. There's a there's a quote, you know, sunlight is said to be the, the best disinfectant from former Supreme Court Justice uh, Brandeis. That's really the idea behind the securities laws. Get all this information out into the open, reduce information uh, asymmetries. With decentralized projects, that, that's just not that you don't have the same rationale. Um, this the SEC 
is going to continue to kind of push the boundaries of its authority to find these central promoters, central actors that are controlling projects. And, you know, the, over the past several years, we've seen the SEC bring actions against Telegram, against Kick, um, against Ripple, against many of the token issuers that have put out coins and have engaged in efforts to drive the value of those coins, put out roadmaps, all the sorts of things that we've discussed. The SEC is focused on the initial sales of those tokens. And that's an important distinction. At the time a token is sold, like Ether, for example, it might be involved in an investment contract scheme. Tomorrow, it might be fully decentralized and there's no longer those promoters. The SEC is generally focused on these first instances of issuance and, and sales that kind of lead up to uh, potentially decentralization of, of the product. Um, the future is going to be a bit different because we have so many decentralized projects today, uh, or at least projects that are attempting to decentralize through DAOs and, and other types of structures. So the SEC now needs to take it to the next level and try to pursue some of these more decentralized projects. That is going to be an important um, distinction between some of the new cases that we'll see brought by the SEC in the future. We also have secondary markets that the SEC has largely disregarded in, in its cases to date. It brought a few, you know, against Poloniex. There was a case against um, a decentralized exchange, um, early decentralized exchange. Uh, these types of cases uh, really were settled, did not really go very far. But now we have cases like Wahi, where the SEC is pursuing um, an ex-employee of Coinbase for insider trading on Coinbase. And so now we're looking at secondary markets for tokens that were sold, potentially securities initially, but the question is whether there's securities today. And there, there are a bunch of arguments that might be made around decentralization as to why they're no longer securities, why, why they're more akin to the orange groves being sold separately or with, with that technological you know, method of, of governing the, the process of, of selling the oranges. And that that's going to be something to watch. And then just the general argument around there's no business relationship between a project uh, and the person that purchased it in the secondary market, potentially, if they, they didn't purchase it in the same way that a venture capital fund goes and purchases from uh, the issuer. So th those are going to be some key things to watch going forward. And then and similarly on the, the CFTC side, they're bringing cases with respect to their authority in spot markets, which is limited to anti-manipulation and fraud. So they're looking at things like did somebody uh, sell a token associated with some sort of fraudulent scheme uh, and that token they would deem to be a, a commodity or some sort of stable coin? Um, there's a case brought against um, Bitfinex involving Tether. Um, so these types of fraudulent related claims. Um, and then also cases where there is a, a registration violation. So a, a project deploys a smart contract based futures exchange, gives it to a DAO. Um, this is what happened in the Uki case, if people are following that. Um, and the CFTC pursues both the developers as well as the DAO itself for liability for, for violating um, certain futures laws. And so th these are the sorts of things to watch uh, in, in the space. As technology decentralizes and evolves, the regulators are going to need to get creative with their authorities because their authorities are primarily uh, you know, focused on centralized intermediaries as opposed to uh, these decentralized protocols and platforms. And yesterday on the show, we I put up that spectrum uh, of assets, right? And on the left side, I had the CFTC, who regulates commodities. And on the right side, I had the SEC, who's regulating securities. And then I had these lines where like those regulations stop. And then we have this middle ground, which is just a lot more of a nebulous stuff. And so from what I'm hearing you say right now, it's kind of like we have the the CFTC and the SEC kind of encroaching from both sides, the SEC from the security side and the commodity and the CFTC from the commodity side. But in the middle is, or, or like what buffers them is the concept of decentralization. As in, you're, you're, I think what you're saying is that the SEC has really gone after some of the obviously and overtly centralized orgs who totally issued a security because that was the low-hanging fruit. And you're saying that the SEC is going to start to work upwards a little bit and try and go after more and more decentralized pro uh, projects. And whether or not they are successful is going to be determining where that line is as to in the crypto industry as what the SEC can regulate. And so uh, and is that a fair take of how you think this is going to go? 
Yeah, regulation of crypto is a zero-sum game between these agencies, right? So you've, you've got the SEC trying to push the boundaries of its authority over uh, investment-like instruments through this investment contract uh, framework that gets applied retroactively uh, versus the CFTC that's saying that a bunch of these assets are, are already sufficiently decentralized. They, they trade in markets very similar to wheat and corn and other um, commodities. And so you've got this kind of encroachment of both from, from various sides and trying to, to figure out what fits into what bucket. And NFTs are a little bit different because they have non-fungibility and, and so they may, may not be commodities. But um, but that's really the idea that you have two regulators trying to stake their claim. And the CFTC is seeking additional authority over crypto. It's very likely that in the near future, we'll see the CFTC regulating crypto spot markets uh, that are non-security crypto spot markets. And so they're they're on a mission to kind of stake their claim, show that they're they they're the cop on the beat for for these non-security crypto markets. And the SEC is doing the same thing, except the SEC probably wants to take the vast majority of it, as Gary Gensler said. So is like the illustration of this like we have the CFTC, the SEC, and then the crypto industry, and we're like in this three-way Mexican standoff. Everyone's pointing their guns at each other, and the CFTC is looking at the SEC and saying, "Hey, I I want to regulate crypto." SEC is looking at CS CFTC and is like, "Hey, we want to regulate crypto." And then there's a the crypto industry is like, "We don't want either of you two people." Uh, is is that kind of a, a fair way to illustrate this? I think that's right. I think that the issue is that. Most people are okay with the CFTC taking some authority there, but CFTC doesn't even have the the ability to regulate these spot markets. So it's okay to have some fraud and, and manipulation uh, protections. That's that's a good thing uh, as as investors in the space. Um, the SEC is is trying to take jurisdiction, but they're not willing to to put out any new rules for crypto. And so the market structure, which we can get into later, you know, it doesn't really fit for crypto and so crypto is like, like hey back off we, we don't want to be under this tent because it doesn't work for the way the technology functions um if if the technology could be incorporated within the securities structure why not i mean it it, it might afford enough protections uh that makes investors uh come from all, all over the world to, to to get into crypto markets i mean i think there's there's definitely some hesitation uh that that these markets are totally unregulated on, on behalf of, of some in the space Others would prefer for it to be less regulated, but certainly the solution for crypto regulation under the SEC umbrella shouldn't be as comprehensive as uh, other types of securities because they're just, just they're different, right? They're decentralized. They're, there's not really the same um, disclosure issues in many cases. And and you know that I thought that the the example from bigger, faster, stronger is really helpful to think about this because. You know, as consumers, we want we don't want a proprietary blend. We want to understand what's in there. It's kind of what FTX was offering. Like we didn't know what was happening in in Sam's box. Um, but in this in in DeFi, we kind of have an idea of what's happening in the box. And so I think that that's an important distinction and and something that regulators should consider as as they're developing new rules, which really are required for for crypto to work within the securities umbrella. And that's the point I really, really want to drive home is that like, all right, if, if listeners are, are fearful of this, like, oh, like uh, the power of crypto is going to be like inoculated by the SEC or CFTC, like they're going to take all the fun out of it. They're going to take all the point out of it. The solution to securities laws and probably a seemingly large number of CFTC like, uh, you know, regulatory aspirations, the way that we fight back against this is the thing that we've already been doing in the crypto space in the first place and the whole point of this movement, which is decentralization. And so like the, it's the there was that recent case against like Avri for who was manipulating markets in, in DeFi. They went after the guy, not Uniswap or Aave. And why didn't they do that? Why didn't the CFTC go after uh, like the markets on which the market manipulation occurred on? It's because they're decentralized. And it's going to, I'm, my take is that it's going to be the same thing with the securities markets, is that if the, if the ire of the SEC comes upon us, the way that we fight back with them is by being decentralized and making sure that there is no line between the private coordinators of an asset and the public markets who are buying that asset. And what does that look like? That looks like a DAO. That looks like a decentralized organization where there is no central party. And all of a sudden, the SEC has no one to go after. And so they can't really find the point to sue or to take to court. And so the way that we fight back by this encroachment of 
the CFTC on one side and the SEC on the other is just by decentralizing everything. Is that a fair take, Mike? I think I think that's a fair take. There's certain things that have to occur on regulated platforms as the, the laws exist today. So if you want to offer a national securities exchange, you do have to register with the SEC. So if you're offering tokens, even if it's on a decentralized platform and those tokens are securities, you're, you're subject to SEC reg regulation and registration. Similar on the, the CFTC side, that's what happened with Thuki Dow. Um, and so there, there's decentralization up to a point, um, but there are many things that, that don't require registration with the regulator. Um, DAOs don't necessarily, you know, always engage in activities that are regulated activities. And so the the idea of, of decentralization takes a lot of these tokens out of the SEC regulation bucket, but it doesn't necessarily take the platforms out of the bucket. Mm -hmm. But that might might be something that that's subject to change, right? Because if, if you're looking at a, a DeFi protocol that works exactly as designed, um, Mango, you know, for all its flaws, worked as, as it was designed. Um, that doesn't mean that market manipulation uh, is, is legal. And so, so there, there are issues uh, potentially with, with kind of the tactics used to drive up the price and, and engage in, in that sort of behavior. Um, but the, the idea that some of these platforms require registration and comprehensive oversight um, th that's really an open question because the, the, everything's on the table. You can use these at your peril. Um, and if, if you enjoy using them and, and it works the way you expect it to work, what's the real consumer or investor harm? And then this one last angle I want to ask about before we wrap up is going back to that Hillman speech in 2018 that talked about the transition of a security into a commodity. And while I was um, doing a little bit of research for this for this like whole rabbit hole I'm going down, uh, Coin Center actually when they when they they have a page uh, about is Ether a security, and they argue they, I I think if I'm interpreting that page correctly they argue that. The investment contract for Ether did make that investment contract a security. And then when Ether is issued out on the actual blockchain in the Genesis block, Ether got distributed in the Genesis block of Ethereum, it became not a security anymore in that moment. So Ether, the currency, has never been a security. But the note, the investment contract that people pay their Bitcoins or wired funds to, uh, that was a security in the interim time when payment was made and then Ether was distributed. That part, that very small part of time was a security. And there's this all, also this catch-22 out of the Gensler administration where Gensler's like, hey, like uh, token issuers, come in and chat with me. Also register your security. But it feels like a trap because once you become a registered security, you can't un become an unregistered security. There's no way out of that of that that room. Like you get stuck in there, and there's no way to be to decentralize and become a commodity. And so, can you talk about like this concept of starting centralized and the need to be able to actually have viable paths towards decentralization while also being compliant by the SEC? Like this is like the frontier that we need out of the SEC, right? Yeah, that's right. And and. If we're looking at investment contracts, if you don't have other security-like features that put you in one of the other buckets, the token isn't the security. It's that investment contract. It's the scheme. It's a legal wrapper that, that envelops the token. You transfer the token. The investment contract might go with it. Um, if, if you've got a centralized scheme, somebody that buys that token might be looking to the same person that sold it to the original purchaser. So you, you have potentially a common enterprise and a scheme. The idea that a token can separate out from that investment contract and trade uh, as a non-security is is not really that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of fairly simple and, and should, should be the, the standard that, that everybody embraces, I think, in this industry, because the tokens themselves are just computer code. And so if you, you buy one of these tokens, if, if it has the security-like features, uh, it's, it's, should be treated like a security, um, but if at a later state it's no longer um, enveloped in that investment contract scheme, then you can say, look, it, it's decentralized at this point in time, and we're not going to treat it like a security. Um, and so that that's really what the Hinman speech uh, encapsulated around Ether and, and other crypto assets. The current administration doesn't necessarily agree with this view, but it, but it really embodies what the case law says. Um, the case law focus on these contracts, agreements, uh, schemes, transactions, not on uh, the, like any sort of chinchilla or orange or anything like that. Um, it, you know, so the SEC has been uh, 
very broad in characterizing crypto assets as crypto asset securities or non-security crypto assets, but really it's not the crypto asset. It's it's the, the investment contract. Um, and the SEC refuses under this administration to, to characterize them any differently. But under the Clayton administration and the prior administration, that was really the way that we looked at these uh, assets. And, you know, getting... In a, a crypto asset offered to the public as a, a non-security is, is also not um, an impossible feat. Like you can offer something like a stable coin that doesn't increase in value. And so it, there's no expectation of profits, even though it's centralized. There, there are things that are like NFT tickets uh, that, that might not really necessarily increase in, in value. Um, they're, they're just the right to go go participate in something or a POA app or, or that sort of thing. And so I think there's there's really a, um, a need to distinguish between the the type of asset that you're um, evaluating and not lumping everything into like crypto asset securities or or, or non security crypto assets. There, there's this kind of scheme that runs on top of a lot of these products, and the scheme doesn't last forever. In every case, it, it may have a half life depending on when the project decentralizes. Yeah, right. And that that idea of the scheme not lasting forever is. Uh at the root of what crypto is, right? That's why Satoshi left Bitcoin is because he needed to end the scheme of his existence. Uh, that's why the Ethereum Foundation has never really gone after and made it uh, and been the client team. They've supported many client teams, right? Uh, so that's something that's very true to the ethos of this industry is we want, we need uh, like centralized parties to come and start the thing but then not finish the thing, let the community finish the thing. That's always been the ethos. And so that's very much aligned with what we want out of crypto. Like I've got one last question for you. Like it kind of seems to me that we're not really going to get out of the current SEC administration what we want out of the current SEC, out of the SEC. Do you agree with that take? And if you do agree with that take, like how do we deal with that? Like where do we go from here? I do agree. I mean, when I, when I was first at the CFTC, we, uh, we were, a new administration coming right out of um, Gary Gensler's prior CFTC. Uh, and what Gensler had done under the Dodd-Frank uh, Act, which which would, had been promulgated uh, in, in 2010, we were, we were crafting regulations around that. A lot of these regulations took what was already uh, designed for the futures markets and applied it to swap trading facilities that were new uh, facilities developed under the Dodd-Frank Act rather than craft kind of tailored um, regulations around how swaps trade and the swap regime, Gensler chose to just take pretty much what we had for futures and apply it to swaps. Um, he ignored a lot of the industry commentary saying that this wouldn't work or it was not optimal for swaps, um, pushed forward with with those regulations. And so when I was at the CFTC later, we were, we were evaluating a lot of that. And, and we noticed that it really just didn't work for a lot of the market. And then we, we provided commentary on that. Um, but the, the the Gensler approach is very much, let's push forward and pull everything into the, the existing regime rather than craft and tailor new regulations. He has said that for crypto, the only new rules we might need are kind of crap, you know, very tailored disclosure um, rules, similar to how we have uh, different disclosures for asset max securities. So it's very unlikely that if we continue to have a Gensler-led SEC, we'll see new rules, new market structure for crypto assets. Instead, the approach is that every crypto asset or the vast majority of crypto assets uh, in Gensler's view are securities. And so the issuers of these securities should register them with the SEC, the exchanges, broker dealers, investment advisors uh, in this space should all register with the SEC. And we should just treat everything like the existing securities market. What do we wind up with? The same securities market we have today. No, nothing new for crypto, you know, not taking into account the fact that you can go on to a decentralized exchange, hook up your ledger wallet or your MetaMask, pull assets off, trade them um, in very different ways than you can securities. Um, notwithstanding the fact that these aren't certificated like other securities, you don't need clearing houses in the same way. Um, so the Gensler approach is not to create a new regime, it's just to loop it all in the same regime, get everybody to register, do public offerings. It doesn't work for crypto. If we we get a new uh, get you know, SEC administration, possibly that will change. We don't know. It, it really depends where where things shake out. The SEC's approach is going to be to bring enforcement actions to define the contours of its jurisdiction. 
to push from these Section Five, which is in a you know securities offering that that was required to be registered. The SEC's brought primarily Section Five cases over the years, um, as well as some some fraud and, and other things. Um, to push from those cases to bring cases involving secondary markets and involving decentralized uh, uh, projects. And that's going to be what defines the contours of what's a security. And if you wind up in that security bucket, you really have no choice but to, to collect the securities laws. A lot of these projects move overseas to, to avoid this. But if blockchain assets are freely transferable, can transfer across uh, wallets throughout the world, it's very difficult to just push all of this innovation overseas. And, and that that's not the right thing for this country either. And so I, I think we're, we're at a, a little bit of a, a an impasse with the CFTC uh, being the, 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 I don't want to say it's an easier regulator to deal with, but right, right now they don't even have the authority to comprehensively regulate the markets. And so it gives a little bit of time for legislators to craft legislation that that appropriately regulates the markets. And so a lot of crypto projects are going to be pushing the boundaries of this decentralization narrative to get outside the, the scope of the SEC's jurisdiction. And I expect this year we'll see some big cases uh, decided like Ripple. Um, the Swahi case could resolve this year. The Uki Dow case is kind of continuing to, to can, uh, you know, go on this year. So some of these cases will provide a little bit more clarity on where the boundaries lie. But I do view this as a, a year of of decentralization versus regulation. The the projects are going to push the boundaries. Form DAOs continue to kind of move outside of the the regulatory perimeter, uh, or or at least try to do so. Where the re the regulators are just going to continue to kind of march forward into that territory, and it's it's. It's really hard to say where it winds uh, winds up, but I think the FTX uh, implosion has really ticked off a lot of the the regulators and a lot of folks on the hill, and we're seeing um, banking regulators kind of warning uh, banks against investing in crypto assets and and just a lot of negativity. But the crypto industry is really strong and resilient, and we've gone through these periods before. I mean, I remember. 2013, when everybody on the on the hill basically was it was anti crypto, and um, I think we'll pull through. So it, it's just going to be a little bit of a, a a battle this year. Yeah, well, the crypto industry is certainly not known for backing down from battles, that's for sure. And, and definitely one thing that's kind of uh, stands out to me. It's may, maybe ironic is that like the actions of the SEC are pushing the crypto industry to be more and more decentralized. And the more and more the decentralized the crypto industry becomes, literally the that's the solution towards securities laws. Like why do securities laws exist? It's because there's information asymmetries between centralized parties and the public market. And if there, if everything just de becomes decentralized, then that's all, that problem is solved. But the ironic thing is that I don't think the SEC is going to see it that way. They're going to only view it as decentralization theater or fake decentralization and not accept that things are actually becoming decentralized. And they're going to continue to march and try and go after more and more decentralized projects and not accept that the decentralization that does exist in these projects is actually real. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's right. You know, meaningful, true decentralization is going to be critical. It's not about decentralization theater. Projects need to move towards Bitcoin, towards Ethereum, really build out the value proposition to a distributed network of users and focus on that ethos as opposed to an ethos of let's just create a centralized team that runs the DAO and controls everything and you know, one guy's gonna hold the admin multi-sig and, and that's gonna control the the smart contracts and and we'll call it a DAO because people vote on that. Like we we really will need to see meaningful decentralization to to see these projects escape SEC scrutiny um and enforcement actions. But there are many projects that are moving in that direction, and, and I do see it as a, a viable uh way to to escape the regulatory perimeter. But that's that's just not to say that, that every project will, will meet that stringent criteria. And um, the SEC is, is going to be pursuing everybody. I, I think they're, they're not necessarily going to back down from taking harder cases because they view their jurisdiction pretty broadly. But even Gary Gensler has admitted that he does not view certain crypto assets that 
look like digital gold to be securities. And so there is a, a, a at least a, a sliver of assets that fit within this There's a bucket line somewhere. of not security crypto assets. Yeah, there, there is a line. And Ether, you know, there's pretty good arguments that Ether fits in that bucket. The CFTC currently regulates uh, Ether futures. They've also viewed assets like Tether to be non-securities. Um, so that there's a bucket. I mean, there, there's a world where uh, at least some of these more, and, and the key feature, right, that the Gary Gensler is looking at is decentralization, because what else? I, I mean, the utility of digital gold is not so so encompassing that it's like a condominium unit. Uh, it, it really is this, it really is this decentralization aspect that drives the analysis. And that's where, of course, and, and the SEC is going to to push to to kind of sniff out the the projects that are less decentralized. Well, Mike, I've turned a, I learned a ton on the show, so thank you for joining me while I'm going down this uh, securities rabbit hole and, and being an excellent guide. Uh, if people want to learn more about you and what you do and read some of your stuff, where should they go? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. So Mike Selig, ESQ. I'm also on LinkedIn and you can Google me. I write for Coindesk uh, from time to time. And, and uh, yeah, love to uh, chat if anyone wants to reach out. We'll put all of those links in the show notes and more. Mike, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bankless Nation, you know the deal. Risks and disclaimers. Uh, crypto is risky. DeFi is risky. You can lose what you put in. Some of these assets might try and be regulated by Gary Gensler, but if they do, we will fight them back if that is uh, what is deemed justified. Uh, but you can lose what you put in. Uh, we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we are glad you are with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot.